Hi everyone, I thought I'd say a quick thank you before we get into chapter 172. Uh, thank you for 100 subscribers, that's insane. Um, I'm so happy that it makes everyone happy and I love reading all of your comments, even if I don't necessarily reply to everyone, I appreciate every single one of you and the story is starting to get darker and darker and sadder and sadder. And in this chapter, I have to warn you, it's death of a key character. Um, it's personally getting harder for me to read it because I know what's coming. And as a lot of you probably already know what's coming too. Um, so get yourselves prepared mentally and um, we'll do it together, I guess. <laughs> anyway, here we go. Chapter 172. The War. Summer. 1981. James recovered, slowly. He was moved back to the Potter house the next day, waking up groggy, unable to say very much, quickly falling back to sleep. But Dumbledore declared this a temporary situation. He told Lily to prepare to leave at a moment's notice. After months of being regarded as junior members of the Order, the Marauders and their friends suddenly had all eyes on them. At the next Order meeting, which James insisted on attending, despite his weakened status. There was definitely whispers. Seven kids, three of them wealthy heirs to the pureblood houses, two muggle-borns, a werewolf, a novice healer. What made them so special? Could they be trusted? They had survived the war so far, against all the odds. Were they just lucky, or was there something more to it? Who were these kids who had escaped six Death Eaters and somehow reversed an almost incomprehensible curse? They had gathered in a small cottage, somewhere in the Peak District. It was a small living room, but the order was small by then. At the end of the regular meeting, which had really become more of a remembrance service for people they had lost since the time they'd met, Dumbledore asked Lily and James to stay behind while everyone else headed home. In turn, James asked Remus, Sirius and Peter to stay. Are you sure? Sirius whispered urgently. After everything that's happened? After everything that's happened, I want my best friends nearby. James replied. Remus felt a swell of pride at that. To James, good sportsmanship extended to every element of his life. To mistrust the people he loved would be highly dishonourable. Sirius folded his arms, but didn't argue. James sat in a chisel armchair, his back straight, his face set. He looked perfectly healthy, unless you really knew him. His cheeks were more hollow, his skin paler, and, though everyone was pretending they hadn't noticed, his jet black hair now had a few threads of grey. Lily had brought a blanket to lay over his lap, but he kept pushing it off irritably. I'm fine, he muttered under his breath. Leave me be. There's no need to be like that. Lily his back. She was looking a lot paler too, her face tired, lined with worry. Remus had never seen Lily and James snap at each other before. It felt horrible. Harry was fussing, flailing his arms and making a face. Lily was taking no chances now. They went everywhere as a family, or nowhere at all. Shh. She jiggled him on her hip. Quiet now. Mummy and Daddy are busy. Give him here. Sirius held out his arms. We'll have a little play, won't we, Harry? He lifted the little boy up and Harry squirmed and giggled delightedly. He wasn't saying many words yet. Dada, Mama, no. And for some reason, bike. That was about the extent of it. But he knew his godfather. Remus wondered whether it was the smell of old leather. His own experiences with Harry were hit and miss. They got on okay until the kids started crying and Remus was no good at pretend play, like Sirius was. The pair settled down on the living room floor, Sirius with his legs splayed out, Harry between them. Sirius pulled a little toy train out of one of his jacket pockets, and Harry began pushing it across the bumpy rug, burbling happily to himself. Sirius beamed at him. He was so good with children. Remus felt a weird sense of dissonance. Did Sirius want kids of his own one day? They'd never discussed it, and Remus had never had the slightest interest. He didn't feel qualified to be a parent, and he wasn't sure he ever would. Maybe it was that, then. 
Maybe that was why Cyrus was acting so strangely. Remus's private worries were interrupted then by Dumbledore, who cleared his throat, commanding everyone's attention. <coughs> we have reason to believe, he said quite calmly, that Dumbledore's focus has changed. Everyone looked up, even Sirius. We've received some information that the Dark Lord has become aware of a prophecy that was made early last year, which seemed to refer directly to him. A prophecy? Peter leaned forward. What prophecy? What did it say? It is better that we share only the most pertinent details, Dumbledore said sharply, particularly in mixed company. Everyone looked around the room. Remus felt a bit queasy. He did not consider the people congregated to be mixed company. They were his friends, his comrades, and the people he trusted with his life. He tried to catch Sirius's eye, hoping for some reassurance. But Sirius quickly looked away. So, he's changed his focus, James said, breaking the discomforting quiet. What does he want now? In short, Mr Potter, Dumbledore said directly, he wants you, or rather, your son. Lily let out a horrible gasp, her hand flying to her mouth. James gripped the arms of his chair. Peter had an odd sort of nervous spasm. Sirius gathered Harry up and stood up at once. What? I am sorry, Dumbledore said steadily. But I have it on very good authority. Whose authority? Lily asked, sounding strangled. That I cannot say. I will not place anyone else in danger. There's a spy then, Peter said, wringing his hands anxiously. On their side, I mean. I cannot say, Dumbledore repeated. Well, you'd better say something useful, James returned, almost shouting. What do you mean, my son? How can Voldemort even know about Harry? We can't trust anybody. Sirius said quietly. James turned to look at him, a look of pure disbelief. Inwardly, Remus was relieved. James trusted his friends. Of course he did. Sirius was being paranoid. But why Harry? Lily asked shrilly. Voldemort believes that Harry will one day grow up to defeat him. Is that what the prophecy said? Dumbledore inclined his head slightly, as if considering this. It is what Voldemort believes, he said eventually. And that is the same thing. You'll have to hide, Sirius said, talking directly to James now. All three of you. There have to be more charms, stronger magic we haven't tried yet. We'll send you to bloody Timbuk too if we have to. Padfoot, James said, raising a hand. Calm down. I will not, Sirius shouted, red in the face. For a weird split second, Remus didn't recognise him at all. Harry started crying, reaching for his mother. Lily took him and cuddled him close, kissing his fine black hair and whispering soothing nonsense. Sirius is right, Dumbledore said still infuriatingly calm. You will have to hide. Plans are already in motion. How soon can we go? James asked. Today? Soon, Dumbledore said. I will come for you. Okay, James nodded. Okay, right, good. You will all remain vigilant, I trust, Dumbledore continued, beginning his closing address. He looked at each of them, as if to impress the gravity of the situation. When he met Remus's eyes, Remus made sure to stare back, 
and tried to transmit an aura of reliability and strength. Dumbledore gave the briefest of nods, before moving on to Peter. And none of you will share this information with anyone outside of this room. They all nodded. Remus's head was spinning. If Lily and James went into hiding, what did that mean? Would they be stuck in Moody's cellar like he'd been? He dearly hoped not. He wouldn't wish that on anybody, least of all his best friends and their baby. Once Dumbledore had left, they walked out of the cottage into the thick amber evening sunlight and looked at each other again. Harry had fallen asleep by now, nestled in Lily's robes, one chubby hand fisting her long red plait. You'd all better come over for dinner, James said with a strained smile. Just in case we don't get another chance. A lump developed in Remus's throat and lodged there for the rest of the night. Still, they had a nice time. Gully the house elf prepared a full Sunday roast at short notice. Glorious roast beef, golden roast potatoes and fluffy Yorkshire pudding, two kinds of stuffing, mouth-watering rich dark gravy, carrots, parsnips, peas, broccoli. Remus hadn't eaten on that scale since Hogwarts. Before they began, James raised his glass to toast. To our friends, he said, shooting a slightly pointed glance at Sirius. Who've always been there for us, through thick and thin. Lily, Harry and I love you all so much. Remus had to excuse himself after draining his glass. He spent a few minutes composing himself in the downstairs loo. When he came out and returned to the table, Sirius was watching him again his eyes narrow, his mouth an inscrutable straight line. Wednesday the 10th of June, 1981. Two days later, Sirius disappeared in the night. He must have crept away deliberately, because Remus didn't even realise until he woke up the next morning and rolled into the cold, empty pillow. He sat up, confused. Sirius? He called to the rest of the flat. It was empty. He got up and went into the living room and checked the kitchen. Sometimes they left each other notes. There was nothing. But Sirius's shoes were gone, and the keys to the bike. So he must have left of his own free will, at least. Remus sat at the kitchen table and waited, chain-smoking. He wanted to contact someone, but there wasn't anyone he was sure he could trust. Sirius's conspiracy theorising was starting to get to him. Finally, the front door clicked open, and Sirius's familiar footfall could be heard entering the flat. Remus almost got up and ran to meet him, but he had been treating Sirius with kid gloves ever since James's attack. Mooney? In here. Oh, hello. Sirius stood in the kitchen doorway. He looked flushed. He must have been on the bike. All right. Where have you been? I was worried. Sorry. He pulled a face and came to sit down at the table too. Remus watched him. He seemed happy. His hair smelt of the countryside, and he was sweating a bit through his black t-shirt. It was gearing up to be a very warm summer. He picked up the cigarette packet, took one out with his teeth, and snapped his fingers to light it. Remus waited patiently. It happened, Sirius said finally, his face shining strangely pearlescent in the weak light of the morning. They're hidden. Lily and James? Remus squinted, scratching his head. How? Dumbledore sorted it. Why didn't you take me with you? Remus wanted to ask, before scolding himself for having such a selfish thought. That wasn't the important bit. Is it safe? I gave James a whole scroll on security charms to use, did he? They won't need any of that. Sirius waved a hand. He seemed weirdly triumphant, as if he'd just bested Remus at a chess game. Dumbledore came up with something better. What? The Fidelius charm. The. Remus frowned. He vaguely remembered having read about that. Something to do with implanting a secret into another person. It was powerful stuff, he knew that much. No one would ever be able to break it except the secret keeper themselves. Well, that'll do it, I suppose, he said. But wouldn't they need someone to put the secret in? Is it Dumbledore? 
He volunteered, Cyrus said. But in the end, we thought it was better if it was one of us. One of us? It dawned on Remus all of a sudden, as if Cyrus had dumped a bucket of ice over his head. No, Remus said, shaking his head. Cyrus was staring at him intensely, his eyes dark blue and more serious than they had ever been. Remus wanted to hit him, shake him, wring his neck, anything to get some sense into his stupid thick skull. No, he said again. It's too dangerous. Mooney, Sirius started. Don't you moony me, Remus said sharply, standing up. He had to pace, had to move, just to keep up with his thoughts. You're stupid. It's the stupidest idea you've ever had. It's not my idea. Oh, don't tell me you didn't volunteer. Remus rounded on him, furious. Don't tell me you didn't jump at the chance. To help my best friends? To help Harry? Of course I did. Cyrus was shouting too, and it was awful. Find someone else, Remus begged. Anyone. I'll do it. You can't. Cyrus shook his head. It has to be me. You know it does. No. You can't just keep saying no. It's done. It's dealt with. Remus really thought he was going to hit Sirius for a moment. Hit him or burst into tears like a child. He did neither. He sat down hard and covered his face with his hand. You bastard. He muttered. It's going to be okay. I've made sure. Sirius said, reaching out to him. Remus battered his hand away. You just did it, without even telling me. I'm telling you now. Remus glared at him. He was going to say something he regretted in a minute. If he didn't leave, he was going to say something he could never take back. He swallowed his rage, stood up, and walked out of the flat. Friday the 24th of July, 1981 So it was done. After that argument, everything happened very quickly. There were no goodbyes. Lily, James and Harry simply vanished without a trace. Remus knew better than to ask where they were. He wanted them to be safe, after all, and he wanted Sirius to be safe. The order was told that the Potters had gone into hiding, that Voldemort was after them because of Lily's blood status and her marriage to James. It's awful not trusting anyone, isn't it? Peter said as they left that meeting. Yeah, Remus agreed glumly. It's necessary, Sirius said. And if I knew who the spy was, I'd kill them myself. I wouldn't even need magic. Peter and Remus stared at him, shocked. Sirius, Remus said, putting a hand on his shoulder. We can't start acting like Death Eaters. James wouldn't want... James doesn't want his child to be murdered by a lunatic on a power trip, Sirius ranted jerking away from Remus's touch. You've gone soft, Mooney. If I have, Remus thought to himself. It's because of you. No one fell in love with a hard heart. He'd learnt that lesson more than once. Still, as dreadfully as Sirius was acting, Remus was inclined to make some allowances. It was a very difficult time, the darkest point in a war, and everyone was handling the pressure differently. Peter and Marlene threw themselves into work, they were rarely seen not rushing to one place or another. Mary seemed to withdraw into the muggle world more. She was always around when you needed her, but her mind often seemed in two places. Remus had his drinking and his self-pity. So if Sirius wanted to be the angry one for a bit, fine. But it was still a war. War does not make allowances or give anyone time to catch their breath. It's relentless and unforgiving and unimaginably cruel. It was only a week or so before Harry's first birthday. Sirius had just got in from Diagon Alley. He'd gone in search of something appropriate for a one-year-old, and instead returned with an actual broomstick. Sirius! Oh, come on, Mooney, it's only little. He's a baby. Got to train him young if he's ever going to play for England. Remus laughed indulgently and sipped his tea while he watched Sirius wrap the toy. He hadn't seen him so happy in a while, and it was so nice. Then it happened. There was a strange scent first, which only Remus picked up. 
familiar and friendly, magical. Then, in a flash of bright light, an enormous silver Patronus burst through the wall. It was a lioness, and it prowled the room, snarling. Fucking hell! Cyrus leapt up, backing away. The huge cat looked at them both with plaintive eyes and opened its mouth. The scream which emanated from it was bone-chilling, and all too familiar. It was Mary. Help, it wailed. Hollyhoke House. And then it vanished. That's the McKinnon's address, Remus said, getting up to put his shoes on. Where are you going? Cyrus asked. To help Mary, Remus said impatiently, fumbling with his laces. Come on. Mooney, no, Cyrus said. We can't. We have to follow protocol. Contact Moody or Arthur or Frank or fuck protocol. Rima shouted. It's Mary. She asked for help and I'm going. Stay here if you want. Of course Sirius didn't stay. They arrived outside Hollyhoke House, maybe ten minutes after getting Mary's Patronus. Neither of them had ever been to Marlene's home before, though she'd described it a few times. It was a lovely old Tudor-style cottage, located a few miles outside of a village in Sussex. There was a long garden path, with a border of bright pansies and geraniums, red, purple, yellow, pink. The front door was painted a soft, dusky green, and if you craned your neck, you could just make out the tops of three Quidditch hoops in the back garden. It might have been pretty, but not today. Mary was standing at the top of the path by the roadside, frozen, staring blankly up at the sky. The dark mark hung over the yellow-thatched roof, an enormous black cloud, the unmistakable shapes of skull and snake. No! Remus gasped. Mary turned to him with tears in her eyes. They're all dead, she said. Are you sure? Sirius said, taking a few steps up the path, wand raised. Yes, she said. Yes, they're all lined up very neatly. What? He looked back at her, frowning. Lined up, in a row, she repeated. She swayed for a moment, and Remus put his arms around her, in case she was going to faint. She leaned into him, weeping silently. Stay with her, Sirius said, continuing up the path. Remus began to tremble. It was like a nightmare, like a horror film. He watched Sirius approach the door, push it open, call inside. We were supposed to meet for lunch today, but she never came. Mary whispered against Remus's shoulder, still clinging to him. I thought she was just busy at the hospital. I tried to find her after work, but they said she'd never gone in. So I came here and I... It's okay, Remus said, because what else do you say? The mark was there, and the door was open and... Oh, God, Remus, all of them, her mum, her stepdad, and Yaz and Danny, just lying there. <laughs> My eyes. She began to sob in earnest, and Remus held her tighter, feeling his insides turn to water. Sirius came out of the house, even at a distance. Remus could see the look of horror on his face. He made his way quickly towards them. I'm going to get moody, he said. I'll be back as soon as possible, okay? Don't go in there. And with that, he disappeared with a loud crack. <laughs> That's it, Mary cried, hysterical. It's over. I can't do this anymore. End of chapter 172